My name is uh, Anwar Majid, and I am the director of the Center for Global Humanities. It's a brand new venture. This is the inaugural event uh, of the center, uh, which uh, took quite a few months to bring to this moment. I have, oh, if I can find my list of, there it is, <laughs> list of names. Um, the, the Center for Global Humanities uh, was established uh, on the premise that the humanities are crucial and vital to the life of any culture and civilization. I know uh, nationally and even internationally in some cases, the, uh, the governments and foundations are not giving enough support to the humanities. And as you know, as if you've been paying attention to the state of Maine, there have been a lot of budget cuts in these areas. But here at the University of New England, uh, you know, we have made a decision to, in fact, highlight the significance of the humanities and invest a little bit in this venture so as to contribute not only to the life of the university and the college uh, and all the colleges of the university, but also to the community and maybe to the region as well, if not globally. I'll tell you why in a second. Um, uh, the, uh, the approach we did for, for establishing this center is to invite faculty members from all the colleges at the University of New England, College of Medicine, College of Health Professions, the College of Arts and Sciences, and uh, now the College of Pharmacy, uh, which have incredible <coughs> contributions to make to the center, and all of this within the umbrella of the Emerging College of Graduate Studies and also the Provost's Office, which are both contributing to making the center possible. Um, a lot of work has gone into making this uh, program possible. I want to mention a few, but before I tell you what kind of work we're doing today, we are broadcasting this event live on the internet. And so, as when, Rube, when Ruben takes the podium, people globally will be watching what he's saying, and people globally will be watching to what you are asking him and the kinds of questions you're posing to him. Uh, so it's like, if I understand the technology folks on campus, this is the first of its kind, and I hope to become. I hope it will become a, a, a sort of model for the future as we be as we try to give substance to the uh, word global. Uh, I want to thank a number of people who have made this event possible. <clears throat> first of all, you know the uh, senior administrators, including the president Daniel Rippich, Provost Jack Carter. And I'm particularly grateful also for the enthusiasm of Tim Ford, who, uh, who liked the idea from the get-go and supported it wholeheartedly. Uh, and, then number of people, and then a number of people I spoke to initially who gave me unqualified support, who gave the Senate unqualified support. Uh, Marilyn Gulici, she's here. Where is she? There she is. <laughs> she is a very world-renowned uh, scholar in the uh, field of aging, and she will be one of the uh, lecturers very soon, as well as Beth DeWolf gave, gave us support. She couldn't be here tonight, but uh, she also was very supportive. Linda Sarrelli from philosophy, Paul Berlin from his professor of history, uh, now interim chair and former dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. He will also be giving a lecture in the spring. Carl Tony from the College of Health Professions, Jennifer Morton from the College of Health, Profes Health Professions, and <coughs> Clay Graybeal was instrumental in guiding me to meeting these wonderful people who gave me a lot of support and feedback. Amy Lipman, uh, she was also very supportive. Steve Rose uh, from the College of Health Profession, and John Cormier, I don't know whether he's still Dean of the College of Pharmacy, but associated with the College of Pharmacy. Uh, from a, a number of people from the College of Arts and Sciences were also extremely helpful. Julia Garrett was very supportive. Uh, throughout the whole entire process, uh, not to mention my, all my colleagues in the English department. Catherine Frank was always giving me her critical feedback <laughs> to make sure I keep moving right. Ed Bilski, there are other centers at the university, uh, Center for Neuroscience and the Center for Public Health and the Center for Marine Land Interactions, if I'm saying that correctly, the directors of these centers. Uh, <clears throat> Ed Bilski. Phil Young and Ron Duprez. And as I look uh, around the room, I see also a colleague who has been incredibly supportive from, the, from day one, George Young there in the back, 
He, uh, he teaches Russian, uh, Russian literature and Slavic studies. He will also be giving a lecture, I think it's in the spring, uh, 2010. But I have to say, though, that the, the infrastructure for this event was made possible by a handful of people, all from information technology. Uh, Neil Jandro is right there in the back, has been absolutely instrumental in creating the web page, working assiduously on the web page. He and I were working on it last, yesterday, Sunday, in a variety of locations in Biddeford, wherever we could find a Wi-Fi connection. And uh, Kristin Quattrano was very good in designing a lot of the stuff, the material you have in your hands. Uh, she was dedicated from the get-go and believed in the process, uh, in the project. David Johnson, the head of IT, uh, who's been supportive every step of the way, whether I was giving a lecture from Salamanca or whether we were trying to make this event go live right now. Um, he is there in the back. His support was very instrumental. And of course, some members of his staff like John Ellingsworth and Ryan Redra <coughs> behind the projection room. And finally, not, I would like to introduce Ruben Bell. He has the great honor of inaugurating the series. <coughs> and uh, he will be watched live and maybe, in fact, lead the trend into the future. Thank no, you so much no for pleasure. Time. All right. Thank you. Ann Moore, do you want your glasses? Ann Moore, do you want your glasses? Yeah, yeah you might want those. There you are. Well, thank you very much. I'm wearing this mic, and we're using that mic. So if, if we have trouble, Dave will take care of it. Um, thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, Anwar asked me a long time ago if I would do this, and that's the secret of getting people to sign up for things. Ask them a long time ahead of time. And then it's so far ahead of time, they say yes, and that's what I did. And then later they say, why did I do that? But I'm happy to do this. I, I'm, I'm actually honored to be asked to do it. Um, the Center for Global Humanities, as he describes it to me and as he's described it to you, uh, is a good idea in, a, in an age of increasing specialization and also in an age of increasing isolation of the discipline in the liberal arts. Um, I'm happy to see it in place here at UNE and I'm very happy to be a part of it. What we do here and what this thing will do is very important. According to its mission, the center is, and I'm quoting from our page here, interdisciplinary program dedicated to the study of human destiny in the 21st century. That sounds pretty good, pretty lofty. There are two key concepts here. First, interdisciplinary, which gets a lot of lip service in hierarchical institutions, but seldom sees much real daylight. You know that. And human destiny, which is a big picture concept that often gets lost in the particulars of teaching and research. Two good concepts. So what is human destiny? Well, Plato would have said that it is the form of the good fully manifested into the world. It would say like the pursuit of virtue. And until the enlightenment, that would have been perfectly good. It would have sufficed. But after that, our destiny became happiness and its pursuit. Now, what is it for the 21st century? Well, that's not yet clear. There's a lot of cultural sifting going on just now, and a new model for human destiny is shaking out. I'm sure of it. We're all sure of it. The wheel is turning. But if people, and I mean thinking people, do not become engaged in this sifting process, in this turning, with both rationality and charity, and they do nothing to bring order to the process, then the new human destiny just might be nothing but the product of random forces at work in a nature that is red in tooth and claw. Survival of the fittest is not a pretty picture in human interactions. So call it pie in the sky, but the Center for Global Humanities aims to engage in this sifting process in our part of the world by bringing thinking people together for the welfare of our community, but with expectations for the global community as well. Why not? It has to start somewhere. Why not here? So welcome to this, and thank you for coming, and welcome to those people far, far away, wherever they are in cyberspace. Um, what does reading have to do with human destiny? Well, I found from, guess what, reading, a very engaging book 
that it's been a significant part of our destiny for the past 6,000 years as an activity that has done its share of forming that destiny along the way. And we're going to talk about this. But even more surprising, a major element of this cultural sifting that is now upon us is the rapid evolution of electronic media that promises to replace reading and writing with something else entirely. Now, what that is, no one really knows quite yet. But there's every reason to believe that the human destiny will be tied to it, for better or for worse. That's something worth thinking about and worth our time tonight. We'll start with a little group activity to get everyone awake. I'll ask some questions, and you'll raise your hands in response. No incriminating questions like where were you last Thursday evening or anything like that. We'll then see what we see about the state of reading and writing in the world. So here we go. In the last 24 hours, who has read a newspaper? Actually held it in your hands and read it. Okay. Ooh, not everybody. Okay. Who hasn't? In fact, I don't think I have. Okay, in the last week, who has written a paragraph or more in longhand on paper? Pretty good. I haven't. Okay, who hasn't? A lot. Look at that. How many people here know ten poems by heart? That's pretty good. I know some little Ogden Nash ones, but I don't think they count. Okay, how many know five? She knows five. How about three? One? Anybody know? If you don't know poems, you're not going to raise your hand. Okay, that's what we need to know. In the last month, how many of you have received a handwritten letter from anyone? Now, not a postcard, a letter where they seal it and sign it. And, okay. How many haven't got one of those? I haven't since my mother passed away. Okay. We don't do that anymore, do we? In the last 24 hours, how many of you have communicated with another person using only your thumbs? Oh, we got a few, don't we? All right. How many haven't? So there's still hope for the world here, but, it, <laughs> but it's slipping away. All right. Now, for those who use your thumbs, how many of you abbreviate lots of your words into a kind of text message yeast language of its own? Yeah, that's part of it. My daughter sends me those messages. I can't read them, but, but I try. Okay. We could do this all night, but I think we all get the point. Our culture is changing very rapidly. And did you notice? There is a stratification of responses by age in this room. It took our ancestors 2,000 years to develop a workable alphabet, and that constituted a cultural revolution. We are sitting in a room with two generations of people that are visibly divergent in the way they share information and communicate ideas. Now, something momentum this way comes. The book I read was Proust and the Squid by Dr. Mary Ann Wolf, professor of child development at Tufts University, and she's an expert in child development with a specialty in dyslexia. Now, I'll tell you where I found this book, because I always have to plug it. Science News. Anybody read Science News? Yes. That's an old world thing. I've read it since I was in high school. All of my good stuff comes from Science News. I just thought I'd plug that little magazine. There was a little um, uh, review for this book in Science News about a week before Anmar asked me if I would do this program, and I said, yes, and I know the book. Hadn't even read it yet. But turns out I got, I got lucky, and it's, it, it's the book worth doing. Now, I should add that there are some students here who are reading the book for credit, too. It's an option of this lecture series. Now, who are those students? Okay. Now, keep your eyes on these because they need to stay awake during the lecture. <laughs> All right. And we're watching you. Good. And, and welcome here. This is part of this program. As, as it goes along, we want to add more and more students for credit to the thing. So I'll use the book as a starting point for some interesting cultural history and some very provocative ideas. I'll use it as a reference for some neuroscience that we will need to apply to the problem of language as it is read and comprehended by the human brain and mind. I'll range away from it a little and then return to it for a kind of a speculative grand finale that I hope will inspire some good discussion. Now I'll start with a real brief summary of Proust and the Squid. The problem is there's a lot of book here, but I'm going to summarize it. It's really a collection of three books, three parts that could each be freestanding, but they go, to, go together well. The first is how the brain learned to read. 
It's a history of how the brain adapted to a function that it really wasn't designed for. The introduction of writing and reading into an oral culture that was already 60,000 years developed. The fascinating story of archaeology, anthropology, and all those new psychologies like cognitive and evolutionary that keep popping up. The second section, big, is how the brain learns to read. It's an excellent description of the brain centers, neuronal pools, and pathways that have adapted themselves for reading and comprehension, and it's a look at how those centers come together in that almost miraculous childhood process that begins and began, at least with me, with cat, mat, bat, rat, sat. You remember that? The cat sat on the mat. But you know, cat, mat, bat, relatively quickly gave me this gift. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Give thee life and bad thee feed, by the stream and o'er the mead. Give thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the vales rejoice. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Now, the middle of the book is a deep, rigorous neuroscience part with all the unpronounceable names for the brain centers and all those diagrams, and they're good ones. And the third part is what I call what happens when the second part doesn't work, when a child cannot see the cats or the bats or the mats. Now, we know that's bad because the name for this little problem has dis in front of it, D-Y-S. In this part, Professor Wolf gives us a comprehensive tour of the wild and wacky world of dyslexia. It's her specialty, and I think it's where her passion lies, and it's the best explanation of the problem that I've read. But first, we've got to talk about the title, Why Proust and the Squid? I'll let Marianne Wolfe tell you in her own words. In this book, she says, I use the celebrated French novelist Marcel Proust as metaphor and the largely unappreciated squid as analogy for, for two very different aspects of reading. Proust saw reading as a kind of intellectual sanctuary where human beings have access to thousands of different realities they might never encounter or understand otherwise. Each of these new realities is capable of transforming readers' intellectual lives without ever requiring them to leave the comfort of their armchairs. Scientists in the 50s, she goes on to say, used the long central axon of the shy but cunning squid to understand how neurons fire and transmit to each other, and in some cases to see how neurons repair and compensate when something goes wrong. The study of what the human brain has to do to read and its clever ways of adapting when things go wrong is analogous to the study of the squid giant axon in the earlier neuroscience. So she put two divergent kinds of ideas together. And, and so this is more than just reading. Although reading, as Proust reminds us, is a marvelous thing. It's a gift. It is about adaptation, about the plasticity of the brain in response to new demands made on it, and about the result of 6,000 years of training that got our brains to where they are today. And it's about brains that cannot be completely trained. Oh yeah, and it also, it's also about what happens to that brain and to human destiny when it must start that 6,000 year process all over again. Now Wolf goes on to say, and this is very important, we were never born to read. Human beings invented reading only a few thousand years ago. And with this invention, we rearranged the very organization of our brain, which in turn expanded the ways uh, that we are able to think, which altered the intellectual evolution of our species. Now, that's quite a statement. It looks like written language is important. How important is it? Well, this is a humanities seminar, so I, I think we need a good humanities image to lay up there about how important language might be. In Sefer Yetzirah, Book of Creation, third century, earliest work of Kabbalah, describes how the universe was created by Ein Sof through 32 wondrous ways of wisdom. Ten numbers, the Sephirot, and 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. As Ein Sof uttered each number, a different level of creation dropped down. 
ten in all, from Keter, crown, at the top, to Malkut, foundation, feet on the ground. As the letters were uttered, and they combined and recombined in myriad ways, the world in its infinite variety slowly came into being. And so, divine language was the means for creation of all the world, and the languages in the world are linked to it by means of correspondence. World above, world below, apart but interactive. Now, just what that means is subject to interpretation, but as mystical as it may be, it projects a powerful archetypal image of the potential inherent in human language, not just for the dissemination of language, uh, pardon me, for the dissemination of information, but for the shaping of the human mind and character and for the formation of human destiny. This idea is very ancient. Language has always been thought by ancient people to have been mystically given to us for our use. So language alone is powerful stuff. But when it takes form in letters and words, and assumes, it assumes a completely different kind of power, of action and creation of a world and of a mind. Not one, but many kinds of writing have developed in the ancient world. Many kinds of figures from the simple Greek letters to the complex Chinese characters. What a difference. And here's a strange thought. The kinds of characters specific to a population appear to shape the reading brain of those people in a way unique to them. Okay? Swedenborg, the 18th century philosopher and theologian, recognized that people sharing the same language universally share a single genius, as he called it, or national character. But he doesn't comment on causality, leaving us with the notion that it's likely the character that shapes the language. Now concerning which comes first, Wolf goes farther, saying, each major type of writing invented by our ancestors demanded something a little different from the brain. The act of learning to read Chinese letters has literally shaped the Chinese reading brain. And much of what we think and what we think about is based on insights generated from what we read. Indeed, the changing relationship of readers to text over time can even be seen as one index of the history of thought. In this case, function curiously seems to follow form. Probably doesn't, but it seems to. And from this perspective, you see that you really are what you read or not. In the case of those who do not read or those who do not read well. Now, if they are not what they read, they must be something else. Now, hold that thought because that's an important thought, which begs the question, of, those, of who those people are. Now, Wolf calls them the linguistically impoverished. And although no doubt there are predictable socioeconomic demographics at work here, this poverty is not of material but of intellectual richness. And linguistically poor households may be found in all parts of town. The poverty may be plain, uh, from plain old ignorance or even neglect, but it might be from that thing that starts with DYS that abnormality causing some brains to refuse to read. And we'll return to this. In its beginnings, reading exploited older, established neuronal pathways for vision, hearing, motion sensing, shape recognition, automaticity, centers already in use for other functions central to survival, and assembled them into a whole new system for decoding symbols in some meaningful way. Now this didn't happen overnight. We are 6,000 years into this experiment. We're actually getting pretty good at it. Once in place, this system took on a life of its own, even altering the intellectual character of the brain that houses it. Now this comes to, calls to mind the robot that took on a life of its own, even altering uh, its behavior with respect to its human creator. Remember Hal in uh, 2001, Space Odyssey? Okay, uh, and once this quasi-evolutionary feedback loop was underway, human civilization was free to take all the twists and turns that make our intellectual history so rich and so meaningful. So reading is good, but wait, not so fast. All this reading business might not be so good at all. It might be really bad for humanity. 
Now, who would say a dumb thing like that? Well, Socrates would. In fact, he did. 2,500 years ago. The whole idea of written language made him really nervous. Dead discourse, he called it. Devoid of meaning, sounds, melody, stress, intonation, rhythm. Sounds like he's talking about emails, doesn't it? And, and it can't speak back. In his estimation, written words doomed the process of dialogue that was the heart of education. Worse yet, he said that these words could be mistaken for reality and delude people into believing that they understand things when they really don't. You'd think that he had had a vision of the future of children in front of computer screens absorbing but not understanding all manner of information. He feared a superficial literacy not guided by teachers, and he feared that the memory, for him the jewel of human intellect, intellect would wither and die. Well, was he right? Um, there's a quotation from this book, a contemporary quotation from Nicholas Osler, British scholar. He says, in modern Guatemala, Mayans remark that outsiders note things down, not in order to remember them, but rather so as not to remember them. Anybody got their list with them? I've got mine. Excuse me. It's got about six things not to remember that I can do later, because if I tried to remember them, I wouldn't. Now, see, Socrates would abhor that. Okay, so he was right, right? But is it really so bad? Well, no, but not till your hard drive crashes or not till the grid goes dark. Then storing all that information that we have in little electronic boxes might really be bad. There's something to think about. To understand the problems that occur when a brain is unable to read, we must comprehend a lot of neuroscience a litany of Latinate tongue twisters, brain centers specialized for this or that function, neuronal pathways, and anatomical names as well. According to Dr. Wolf, the average child needs to learn 88,700 words by grade 12. I have no idea where that number comes from, but she seems reliable. And 9,000 of these words must come by the end of grade three. But to apply these words effectively in learning to read, all those things we need to know about neuroscience must act seamlessly together. There must be a continuous sculpting of neuronal pools, new circuits made, connecting and reconnecting of neurons and brain centers, the perfecting of sensory experience, activation of attention, timing, focusing, association, and countless other essential functions that must happen in perfect harmony in milliseconds at most. And this is based on the assumption that the embryological development of the whole thing went forward properly. How this all works perfectly most of the time is anybody's guess. Recent, study, recent studies show that it doesn't work perfectly in 30 to 40 percent of our children. One little hitch, and you could even have that dis thing going for you. A brain that seems normal, but just can't do the cat, mat, bat, rat. One little hitch and you could have a child who learns early on that he or she is defective. Now how good is that? The take home lesson about learning to read is this. All our knowledge about learning to read is based on how we have learned to read for the past 6,000 years. It doesn't begin to define what's going on with reading or whatever we want to call it as it will occur as it is occurring now in the third age of human language. What happens when you read from the computer screen neurologically is different from what happens when you read from a page. What are the three great ages of human language? I made this one up. It's not out of the book. Well, here they are right here. The three great ages. This is the first great age. I came here. Notice, no PowerPoint. Okay. I came here. I came to talk. This is the oral tradition. I had some things to say. You're sitting here live. Well, not all of you. You're sitting here live. What I say will, I hope, resonate. At some point, we'll talk back and forth. You're absorbing. I'm emoting. We're understanding that Socrates would love this part, okay? And that's the first uh, great age of language. Here's the second great age. It's a printed page. It's got information on it. An ancient Babylonian compare study, comparison study showing the benefit effects, beneficial effects of an all-plant diet. All right, that's interesting. They did that in ancient Babylonian. What's different with that? Well, my goodness, it's all there. 
Every word I need is there. They've been carefully written, carefully arranged. It's supposed to be, have a start and a finish, and I can work through that and gain information very easily. Well, sort of, unless I can't, because not everybody can. For the past 6,000 years, this is what you got. Here, read this, okay? There will be a test. Now, the third great age of language is this. We all saw that. It's hanging outside. It's right there somewhere. That's a page from a website. That's a web page. Look at the difference. It's got stuff. Plus, it's got stuff in blocks. If you, it's got big letters. It's got little letters down here. Each one of these little blocks says, read me, read me, read me. And, but I choose when I read what. Thank you very much. And I, there's, it's got art. This is great. It, and on a website, they often move these things. It's moving. It's jumping. I get a choice. There are blocks. Diff this is a busy, busy thing. Compare these two things. All right. This is 6,000 years old. How old is this? I don't know. When do we start using computers, all of us? 20 years ago at most? 15? This is new. This is the third great age of language. Now, we need to take a quick look at the dis thing, the dyslexia, and then on to my grand finale. We're not going to define dyslexia because it can't be done, but we're going to define dys, D-Y-S. It's Greek. It's a prefix. Forming nouns and adjectives with the sense bad, difficult, unfavorable, abnormal, or impaired. Let me read you a little bit from Proust in the Squid. Uh, to give us an experience of dyslexia rather than a definition for it. But now keep the definition of dis in your mind while I do. Jackie Stewart, the Scottish racing driver, won 27 Grand Prix titles, was knighted by Prince Charles, and had one of the world's most successful racing careers before he retired. And a friend of mine was one of his mechanics. Okay, he is also dyslexic. Recently, he concluded a speech at an international scientific conference on dyslexia by saying, you'll never understand what it feels like to be dyslexic. No matter how long you have worked in this area, no matter if your own children are dyslexic, you will never understand what it feels like to be humiliated your entire childhood and taught every day to believe that you will never succeed at anything. The plot of the dyslexia story is one that could be told with minor variations all around the world. A bright child, let's say a boy, more often a boy, arrives at school full of life and enthusiasm. He tries hard to learn to read like everyone else. But unlike everyone else, he can't seem to learn how. He's told by his parents to try harder. He's told by his teacher that he's just not working up to his potential. He's not, and he's told by the other children that he's a retard and a moron. He gets a resounding message that he's not going to amount to much, and he leaves school bearing little resemblance to the enthusiastic child he was when he entered. Now, all is not lost. Sometimes this story has a happy ending. After being asked to leave several high schools, Paul Orphalia went on to become the founder of Kinko's. David Neeleman became the CEO of JetBlue. John Chambers became the CEO of Cisco. But a happy ending is not necessarily the norm. And she goes on and on, but that'll tell you what we need to know. So what is dyslexia? Well, no one really knows for sure. It's one of those things we know what it does and not what it is or why it is. We have some good ideas, but the votes are still out. There's a reason that the votes are still out. It has to do with the dis. What if it's not dis at all? Andrew Ellis, British neuropsychologist, says, whatever dyslexia turns out to be, it is not a reading disorder. In terms of human evolution, the brain was never meant to read. There are neither genes nor biological structures specific to reading. Instead, in order to read, and each brain, in order to read, each brain must make new circuits by connecting older regions originally designed and programmed for other things. Dyslexia cannot be something so simple as a flaw in the reading center because there is no such thing. Now that's, that's really, really insightful. So what does exist there? Well, layers of structure and function. The neuroanatomy, the neurophysiology. Well, first we start with the DNA. People differ in their DNA, right? 
That's the, that's the basement. Next layer, neurons and circuits, neurons and circuits of neurons, neuronal pools. Next layer, neuronal structures, large structures, thalamus, cingulate, gyrus, all those things with wonderful names. Those come next. And then finally, an overarching system of perception where those systems all work together. It's like your eye sees, but only like a camera, and it sends a message through a, a neat little um, thing to the, the, um, the cortex in the back, the occipital cortex, and somewhere along there it gets stuck into the associative cortex and you see an image. That's called not sight, it's called perception. Okay, at one time or another, research has pointed to each of these layers as the culprit with good evidence for each. Finally, it seems, there is another better and more logical explanation for dyslexia. It isn't the reading circuitry that is bad. People with dyslexia have entirely different reading circuits unique to themselves. And these circuits are often, more often, in the right hemisphere instead of the left, where most of them live. Okay, and this adapts during development to take over the processing of words. So right there we've got some major difference. For reasons still unknown, these people develop a dominant right hemisphere and reinvent the reading wheel in it. And guess what? These right-brained systems don't match the necessities of the left brain reading world, so they are abnormal by default. They are using right brain centers designed for what? Creativity, pattern recognition, and contextual skills for reading. Okay? And guess what? These right brain systems don't work as well. A few unusual genes cause aberrant patterns of neuronal development in structures necessary for reading, resulting in the creation of whole new, less efficient circuits that were never meant to read at all. So reading is slow and halting, and the person is dyslexic. Now, why do we care about this? Because dyslexia and ADHD, its closely related cousin, may not be abnormal at all. They may be genetic vestiges of the past, the preliterate past, that oral period I was talking about that only lasted 60,000 years, when language was spoken and brains didn't worry about decoding symbols and certain traits were very good to have, traits that favored survival in that world but would favor failure in this one. What are they? Well, fragmented attention. Why? For scanning the horizon, for listening for danger, for keeping an eye on the trees, and for attending to the task at hand, all at the same time. Hey, that's good survival for a Neolithic hunter-gatherer. That's not good survival in uh, Mrs. Reed's fourth grade homeroom. She was nice too, but I tell you, she didn't like that. What else? Impulsive and reflexive motor skills. Perpetual motion that could prevail in fight or flight. It could save your life. Always, always ready to move, always moving, always on the move. Doesn't play well in the third grade homeroom, does it? Okay, what else? A brain that can handle rapid, frequent, small loads of data, but just can't sit there all day. Again, survival skills. Here's Wolf's assessment of dyslexia. Not as a disorder, but as a variation on a theme. What is it about the dyslexic brain that seems linked in some people to unparalleled creativity in their professions, which often involve design, spatial skills, and the recognition of patterns. It's no longer reducible to coincidence that so many inventors, architects, computer designers, artists, radiologists, financiers have a childhood history of dyslexia. In other contexts, for other skills, this differently wired brain might actually be superior or at least not abnormal, which leads us sort of to the grand finale, the dawn of the third age of language. And we discovered in our little survey that age, this age, this new age, is upon us. We will not have the luxury of 2,000 years to ease into the digital age. We had the luxury of 2,000 years kind of getting the alphabet all set, and then we were set to use it, and then we did use it. We don't have that 2,000 years. It's amazing what we do not have. We are being pulled right into that age by our hair, it seems. There are questions 
that I have already alluded to and that you no doubt have raised as well that are important to ask now and even more important to address as we are drawn into this new age of language. Like Socrates, we are contemporary observers of momentous cultural history in the making. We are there. Now, Wolf has plenty of questions. What, she asks, is being lost and what is being gained for so many young people who have largely replaced books with the multidimensional, continuous, partial attention culture of the Internet? Okay, what are the implications of seemingly limitless information for the evolution of the reading brain and for us as a species? Does the rapid, almost instantaneous presentation of expansive knowledge and information threaten the more time-demanding formation of in-depth knowledge and understanding? Well, ultimately, Socrates' concerns apply equally to our own, perhaps more now than before. Will unguided information lead to an illusion of knowledge and curtail the morally difficult, time-consuming, critical thought processes that lead to knowledge itself? Will the immediacy of information gained from a search engine and the volume of what is available derail the slower, more deliberative processes that deepen our understanding of complex concepts and another's inner thought processes and of our own consciousness? She asked good questions. What would be lost to us if we replaced the skills honed by the reading brain with those now being formed in our new generation of digital natives, she calls them, who sit and read transfixed before a screen? Something momentous this way comes. And last, uh, a less momentous thought, perhaps, but fascinating nonetheless. What are the new skills that will be necessary to master these electronic media and tame them and make them friendly to human destiny? How long will it take to develop these skills? And what kind of culture will intervene while they are under construction? Well, these are questions that might bring hope to people like Jackie Stewart, and Thomas Edison, and Alexander Graham Bell, Charles Schwab, Auguste Rodin, Leonardo da Vinci, and regular people like some of you in this room, because of the numbers here, we know you're there, and for me, too. I, too, know what it's like to hold numbers and letters in the air, like spinning plates, sort of, that, but they won't come down sometimes. And I wrestle with words that won't behave. This is good news for me. Let's take another look at the third great age of language, this web page, and all that it represents. What we have here is liberation freedom from the right-brained restraints, pardon me, the left-brained restraints of 6,000 years. What we have here is a garden of earthly delights for those with the skills to master it. And those just might be right-brained skills. Because the architecture of the internet, to a person like me, feels real good. What a wonderful image of a new day dawning, at least for a few of us. And for the rest of you, you normal people, welcome to the wild and wacky world of adaptation. You're going to love it. Well, let William Blake bring it on home with his vision of what this revelation, uh, this revolution might promise to those with differently wired brains. He said, rouse up, O young men of the new age. Set your foreheads against the ignorant hirelings, for we have hirelings in the camp, the court, and university. Who would, who would, if they could, forever depress mental and prolong corporeal war? Painters, on you I call, sculptors, architects, and I'll add, all you right brain people. So, in a moment, I have to learn how to do this, I'm going to write something on the board and then we're done. No, I do this. All right, I did it. It's my manifesto. It's lexics of the world. I think I ought to do something here. 
there. Unite. Our time has come. <laughs> so I think maybe what's coming might be bad. A lot of people think it is. Sometimes I think it is when I see what it's doing. But I do know that this feels real nice to someone who has had trouble with this for their whole lives. And we know for 6,000 years people have. And so I think something momentous, momentous this way comes. But I'm not sure it's bad. And like I said, for all you normal folks out there, you'll just have to struggle to get this new technology. The rest of us are up and running. So thank you. That's all. Now we have plenty of time for questions. We have microphones and things. And I'll just say again how nice it's been to be here. Uh, Anwar made me the guinea pig for the program. So uh, I don't know how that'll work out, but we'll just have to see. You're safe if you're in the witness protection program. Uh, yes, I didn't get to read the book. I won't explain why. But I'm, I was just wondering, as you were writing on the board, does Wolf say anything about the prevalence of left-handedness and dyslexia? She never mentions it, and I'd like to speak with her about it because other people have, but um, she doesn't. Hi, um, you mentioned earlier uh, that uh, both dyslexia and ADD are somehow related, or can you expand a little bit on that? All it amounts to is you often see one, you'll often see both in the same person. You don't always, but often there are, is a little bit of both in each. A dyslexic, a real uh, card-carrying dyslexic will also have some, some uh, characteristics of ADHD or ADD and, and vice versa. They seem to be similar. Since we don't know much about them, we can say that. But they are kind of first cousins. I have a question for the students who are in this class. Um, since you are sort of orienting us in a more optimistic direction about the impact of I am, technologies. And and I haven't always been that way. <laughs> one, one thing that was I hope my daughters are watching because uh, I have changed my mind on this big matter. And they say that I can't do that. Um, um, for the faculty retreat this, this fall, we had um, a professor named Sandra Jameson, <coughs> who is, whose training is in rhetoric and composition. And she also had a very kind of positive view of the fact that students are texting and they're simply engaging with language uh, in, in lots of complicated ways and inventive ways. And um, so I'm curious to know from the students who are in the class who are actually much more thoroughly enmeshed with these kinds of technologies, if they see them as technologies that are altering their literacies in negative ways or in ways that actually seem positive and inventive and creative? Well, I'll answer you like um, Socrates might if he were here. He was against the whole idea of written language. It's going to do all the things he said, and yet it has worked out very well. If he had lived the 6,000 years to see it, he would say, yes, it's all true, but still, Written language has done some marvelous things. I think we're going to see the same thing with digital language or digital information or whatever you call it. It's going to do things differently. We're going to lose some things, no doubt. We're going to win some things or gain some things. But the reason I'm optimistic is because this is the way it's going. If you could talk to Socrates 2,500 years ago, you'd say, no, Socrates, it's too bad. Language is here. We're writing it now. We're using it now. Get with the program and see if we can't make it work. And also, I've changed my mind because, as I said, as a person with a kind of a scrambled brain, what I do on computers is so much easier. It's so much, actually, it's not easier. It's natural. I love those pages with the stuff all over. And I can beam back and forth. And I like the pages that move. And I can take big blocks of information and, uh, or little blocks. And I can read it at my, at my own pace. And, I don't know. I just feel natural there. I took one whole uh, uh, semester of Hebrew once years ago. I didn't like the language very well, but I loved the way it went that direction. I still remember how nice it was to go that direction. And then I transferred to another school, and that was the end of my Hebrew. But I told my wife, who was right there, uh, 
there is something about Hebrew I really love. I have no idea what it is, but I just love that direction. Well, that's just me. There's something in here that likes to go that direction. When I look at a computer screen on the internet, a web page, there's something here that just likes the way they work. So I'm saying we, we can get good at it. We're going to lose some stuff. And a few years ago, I would have been very ne negative, pe pessimistic about what we are going to lose. But you know, we gain so much with print, Socrates' um, uh, warnings notwithstanding, we'll gain a lot from what we're doing and try stopping it anyway. So I say get with the program and see what we can do with it. There's a lady um, back there. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what you think we stand to lose, just kind of being the devil's advocate? Well, uh, what we stand to lose, Marianne Wolf lays out beautifully in this book, and I think she's 100% right. What we stand to lose is the cultural part of reading. When you read a page, lots of things happen in your brain, but what you get, if you're a fluent reader, now that's critical, you have to have come through all the stages of learning to read and not everybody is. But if you're a fluent reader, what you gain from reading the page is far more than the information on it. You gain, first of all, if you're fluent, the time to think while you're reading, the time to actually think about what you're reading while you're reading. And that's a wonderful thing. We don't, we don't notice that. But as we do, we're having what she calls an inner dialogue, but you're also kind of having a dialogue with the author. You're, you're agreeing, you're disagreeing. Um, I think uh, Socrates, uh, would understand why we, we write margin notes in our books. I don't, I don't like books with little, little margins, like big margins, because I'm always arguing with the person, and I want to make comments, and I want to talk back. We're going to lose the talk back, for sure. We're going to lose the inner dialogue, for sure. And we're going to shift, I'm afraid, to an informational mindset from one that has a, a content of morality, of actual... Um, Bliss, little lamb who made thee. That's not information. That's just nice. We're going to lose some of that, is all. And it, it's a trade-off. Yes. Oh, and more. Oh, well, there's a man right yeah, there. Yeah, we, uh, we have a question from New Mexico. Oh, good. I'm Ted DiPadova for watching this from New Mexico. Okay. He's former dean and former uh, uh, vice president for academic affairs at the University of New England. Okay. So the question he's asking is this. The humanities have relied on the printed page as their primary medium. Do they need to adopt new ways of transmitting knowledge and stimulating ideas if they are to survive? Now read that again, please. The humanities have relied on the printed page as their primary medium. Do they need to adopt new ways of transmitting knowledge and stimulating ideas if they are to survive? If the humanities are to survive. Yes, but I think they will. Take a look at this web page. It's beautiful. It's got pictures. It, it draws you in. Here's a picture of an ancient something or other. You probably put it there. You know what it is. Here's people in native <laughs> dress. I'm, all, I'm already asking, who are these people? Do they live there? Uh, we need to adapt new ways of doing this in order to keep the humanities alive. I think we can because already when you go to the internet and you look up Socrates, you get far more than that page of information about his born, died, said this, said that. You get multimedia stuff. And I think, I think that promotes the humanities because when you do that, many more parts of your brain are lighting up, you might say, than before. So I, I don't think it's a problem to maintain the humanities. Possibly the humanities will be the big uh, winner in this transition because humanities is a multimedia sort of a thing. It's, it is multidisciplinary. Uh, it's lots of things, and we can do that better on computers than on a printed page. And I will say, too, I don't know anything about computers, websites, nothing. I'm, computer, I'm, a, I'm a computer user, but no kind of a, a computer whiz. I just like them. I like the way they work. I haven't written something in ages, except at work. I still have to do that. And um, it's so much easier to use a keyboard. Why? Because of the way my brain works. I can't write right. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this may be the same question phrased differently. Are English professors worried about the loss of language? Oh, I think so. And I'm worried about the loss of language because we're going to lose language. I asked on purpose the people who use their thumbs, what sort of language are you using? Weird little abbreviations. But now they'll tell me, well, they mean, it means this, it means that. Yes, it does. But does that, 
does that herald a degeneration of language? I can't answer that. But yes, as an English teacher, if I were one, I would be quite concerned. In fact, I teach humanities, and I have students in my class, and I am quite concerned that language skills, English, is, is falling away, even now. Because I know, because I give them assignments, and they don't all read them. And I think it's because some of them have trouble reading them. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think you've hit on two things. One is something I've noticed, I'm a high school teacher, is the inability to follow directions. And I think they expect to press a button and it's there and to pay the attention to read the instructions through and to figure out how to apply them. Yep. Um, you know, PFD is written on every single paper that I ever do. Also, give evidence, support what you say, um, because they're so superficial that way. And um, of course, I teach freshmen, and I teach them over and over and over again. And so I get smarter and smarter, and they're a brand new group of freshmen every year. Right. But um, I, I think. And, I mean, it seems to me that, that we are losing something. I don't know if you're familiar with the recent Stanford study. or Stanford study, uh, it was in the Academy of Sciences about um, multitasking. Yes. People who do it most are the worst at it. Oh, yeah. and, and that's sort of the sense I'm getting. It, it's, it's that they're, uh, the students are not allowing themselves space, time, thinking, critical thinking, um, the moral dimension that you talk about. Yeah, you can get plenty of information like that. But critical thinking? I don't, I don't see well, it happening. <laughs> well, I agree. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, the multitasking thing, I, I have an article that I give people to read. It says, don't read this if you're doing anything else. <laughs> That's the title of it. Because it, it's, it's good science that shows that the kind of learning that is going on when I'm multitasking, it goes in there, but it's been demonstrated that what goes in there goes into a different place. It goes into a different mailbox. It's not, if you're trying to study for a history test, and you're doing all those things at the same time, it's going in, but it's going into the wrong place. It may not hit long-term memory at all. It may make you smart for the exam, but then next year, it's like, where is Nebraska? I can't remember. So, um, <laughs> it, no, it, it's a, I'm, I'm not glossing over this. Believe me, two or three years ago, I would have been with you, leading the, the vanguard, let's get rid of those computers. But as I said, as I would say to Socrates, writing is here, computers are here. Um, we've got, as, as educators and people who care, we've got to, and, and this is what she says, and it sounds kind of pie in the sky, we can't lose this while we have this. And she says, why can't we, we have both in some way? And I believe we will, because Socrates painted a pretty bleak picture of the world with writing. Well, he uh, was wrong, and certain things came true, but most of them didn't, and in fact, the world of writing has been very good. He would admit that, I'm sure. So we have to say, we can't run the clock forward even 500 years and see what it might be like. But um, I think that I will pick the optimistic road because why not? I feel better when I do. <coughs> well, I'll be a pessimist. Uh, you sort of, you know, you divided uh, the use of language up in, into three epics. But within the written word epic, uh, you know, I'm a historian and I spend a lot of my time in late 19th century letters and documents. Mm -hmm. And the unbelievable fall off in the ability to use the language, uh, forget about texting. I mean, to compare, you know, people with what we would say basically is a high school education, um, I'm often amazed at the sentence structure, the beauty, the flow. No. Forget about my 15 year old kids texting. I yeah. mean, most of our students that we have, you know, could, cannot write anywhere near the way. A reasonably educated person could a uh, hundred years ago. Yep, you're right. Uh, two nights ago, I was reading a book to my three-year-old granddaughter named Sophia. I have to plug her everywhere I go. <laughs> but I, I was reading to her. She was sitting on my lap, and I was reading some little book about bunnies. By and I started reading it. It's by Beatrix Potter, <clears throat> 1906, I think. I'm reading along, reading along. I think this is great. I mean, I I liked it, and uh, it had real words and it had and, and then the neat thing was the three-year-old doesn't know that it's real good or real bad she's sitting there nodding her head looking at the bunnies and the ducks and there were some other things in there but she was getting real good language i'm with you that was 1906 language when you read a book now about ducks and bunnies that's written in 2005 it's not as good it's really not and i don't know what that means there's no need to dumb it down for kids she was buying those words just like any other words but yeah, and 
it, 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 again, the pessimist in, in me sees the, the decline. I don't know what that means. But uh, we're in it. There's no question about it. Yes? Uh, Reuben, when you started off, you mentioned about the different generations that are in here. Is there anything from the author, uh, and probably more importantly from your perspective, about the aging brain and how all this works? She doesn't say a word about it because that's not the focus of this book. But that's an interesting idea to, to look at. Um, young brains probably are much more adept at multitasking than older, I'm just guessing. But she doesn't mention it, and I haven't thought too much about it. Um, I don't know if this new language method will be easier or harder for an aging brain. Probably neither one. Aging brains take care of print pretty nicely now. A hundred years from now, they'll just do that other thing, whatever it is. But she doesn't get into that at all. I bet that would be an interesting topic with her because she knows her science very well. And her focus is childhood development. So she's not spending much time there, but I'll bet you she'd have some interesting insights on that. Uh, one of the things I think that we will probably lose that really scares me, because we see it happening now already, uh, and Marshall McLuhan uh, years ago, who was kind of the prophet of the computer age, who's famous for his, uh, his saying, the medium is the message. Yeah. I think we're going to lose the ability for sequential reasoning. When you have a whole lot of data coming in and you're multitasking everywhere, what you have is a collage. You have a mosaic. And that's what people tend to be thinking in these days. It's really hard to get people to think in a sequential, sequential kind of yep. logic. So we're going to lose, in that sense, rationality, I think, to a great extent. Now, there will be professions that will still have to maintain it. But the larger population, as we see now, thinks in mosaics and collages. Rather than in a linear way. Yeah. And see, that's what Socrates was, was worried about with writing. He said, as soon as you don't have to remember anything, you don't have to remember anything. And then the, <laughs> the, the memory for him was what made this course so rich. You bring your entire encyclopedia with you in your head. You bring yours, I bring mine and then we interface them, and there's a richness there. But now with writing, he says, we don't have to remember. Well, with, with these web pages, we really don't have to remember anything. It just, it just comes at us in little packages, and uh, uh, that's a concern, it's very much of a concern. Uh, what happens to the richness of not only language, but thought and all that? And as I said to this lady over here, reading, if it's done properly, allows time for thought. You, it, it, there's a back and forth. You're dialoguing with the text. And I ought to say, this doesn't invite a lot of that. So we're on the verge of something, as I said, momentous. I didn't say bad. It sounds a little bad. Momentous. And it's coming, and I don't know what it'll look like, even in another 50 years, much less 1,000. Kind of hard to know. Uh, as a question I have, is kind of on what you said, is you can bring a book, and I can bring a book, and we can meet, but now you can be someplace else in the world, mm -hmm. just as you had someone from Arizona or New Mexico here. So I think it was going to broaden that, not narrow that. Uh, another thing I thought was interesting is how you said you would talk back to a book by writing in the margins. Mm -hmm. Now, with blogs and with tweets, you're not talking back to the book you may talk directly to the person whose ideas exactly right. those are, yep. and they can respond to them. But the biggest concern I have is, for a long time, it has been very limited as to who, it's a small group of people who control what is published. Now, it's a much larger group, mm -hmm. and how, how are we training people to disseminate what is legitimate in information and what isn't. Yeah, and how to recognize it and... Right. Yeah. Again, one of Socrates' uh, fears was this, this superficial education not directed by <coughs> teachers. In other words, nobody keep an order. And that's a concern because we know our students go to the internet and if it's in print, it's got to be got to be true. As an old joke, when I was a... when my kids were little, I, they would say something crazy and i say, it must be true. It's in print. Well, if it's on the internet, it's true. And, and I'm sure all of us spend a certain amount of time with our students trying to let them know that just because it's there doesn't mean it's true any more than it's true on a printed page or any more than it's true if I tell you that. 
So, um, but it seems more true somehow to young people if it's there and someone put it there and it's accessible in depth, unbelievable depth. So again, we, we gain, we lose. This idea of, of uh, immediacy, um, of being able to, to communicate with people all over on an idea. I work with people that are all over the place on a regular basis, as if they were in the next office. And it's, the, the internet allows us to go beyond time and space, you know? I leave a message, it comes back. And uh, I send the stuff, they send the stuff back. And that, that is probably one of the biggest gifts we'll get out of the whole thing. We literally, at some point, we're just beginning this. At some point, we'll be so connected, you'll have to go into the house to just find some privacy, if you know what I mean. That's, we'll be very connected, maybe too connected. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thinking about the blogging and reading online and writing online, don't you think that actually students and young people actually train themselves to think critically when they give feedback on blogging? Now, say that again, please. When they actually write comments mm -hmm. at different postings and blogs, yeah. they actually learn to think critically because they yeah. give some, some kind right. of feedback. So maybe that's a new kind of critical thinking? Yes, it might be. It's immediate critical thinking. It's feedback, and you have to filter it just like I do. Some's good, some's bad, but it, the immediacy of it will make it a different kind of a thing. It's less formal, it's just there. And uh, uh, I think we'll learn to work with that. There's an honesty about it, too, that we haven't seen in the past. People say what they think, whether you like it or not. Ruben, I just wanted to say thank you for, your, um, for introducing us to the um, to the book, which, like Rob, I have not read, no. so I've just come to hear what you had to say. But I'm hearing a, a, a whole host of comments here, and so I have a question that's sort of not fully formed, but I was wondering if, um, either in the book or in your own experience, one way or the other, if there's any attention paid to the different kinds of reading or different kinds of text. I mean, is the assumption that this is always some sort of prose nonfiction, or are we dealing with fiction? Are we dealing with poetry at all? Is there any difference in the way um, a, a potentially nonlinear form is processed? Uh, and then sort of relatedly, what happens when we, you know, in English we're always talking about, we read everything, everything is a text that can be read. Um, what about the visual? I mean, so to go back to, to uh, Ted's comment about do the humanities need texts to, sur to survive, I'm thinking of art and reading paintings and so forth. So there's a lot of different questions there, and I guess I would boil it down to whether reading uh, language is radically different than reading uh, an image, and then even within language, whether poetry, prose, other kinds of forms influence the way we process them. I know in our brains, when we look at images, and, and when we look at text, different parts of our brains are definitely at work there, you know, just almost disparate areas of our brain. I don't know, because I'm no uh, neuropsychologist, but I wonder if you mix those things up, images with text, in a, in a really meaningful way, if those, if we couldn't actually become much better at it, uh, neurologically better at it. Because she points out, our brains are very plastic. What works now for images and works, what works now for text is there, okay? But there's other, there's other places your brain could, could use to do these together. You could, even, you could even envision, over time, people getting better and better at melding this idea of an image and text at the same time, and music and, and whatever else. Not impossible, the, the human brain is an amazing thing. It will do what you ask of it if you give it time. I work with stroke people a lot, and they get a stroke and they're devastated, Some, they've blown a panel and here they are, they can't work something, and you tell them now, give it time, give it time, and if they will, they'll get much function back, sometimes from the old spot, but sometimes a workaround. Sometimes with neurons that didn't used to do this, and now they are doing this, and you retrain them, and the next thing you know, you've got function. You've got function where you didn't have it before from a retrained set of neurons and, and nerve centers. So that could happen. Who knows? Because we've been reading for 6,000 years. What if we'd been doing this for 2,000 years? What kind of brains would we have? She speculates a little bit about that. Our brains will change. Not in a forward uh, evolutionary way, not, not that, but they'll change because we will require that of them, and then we will get workarounds. 
because all our brains are pretty much the same, except for that bunch of people with the DYS in front of them. They'll just be having fun. You'll be working. Uh, Ruben, I have a, a question about uh, that, uh, Rob's comment on the, the median uh, is the message uh, made me think about. The, the pre-literate societies came up with great epic poems and, and they could memorize them. Mm -hmm. The Epic of Gilgamesh and uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. In fact, Homer was thought to have been um, illiterate, but he could recite, and he could have been dyslexic, of course, but it didn't matter because he couldn't read anyway. Right. But he had uh, memorized the entire uh, Iliad and Odyssey. Now, from a from a spoken, uh, from an oral tradition to a written tradition, that the epic seemed to have survived quite well. It's quite easy to read. Uh, but this third age, uh, I don't know that the Twitter can support an epic. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a 147-character limit. Yeah. And you're not going to see a 1,000 tweets in a row to go from you know the hero with a thousand faces, and they go from one face to the thousand face. Right. So, if if this message uh, can't be supported on this on this medium, then uh, is that going to be putting the people who rely on this at a, at a terrible disadvantage? And I don't know about a disadvantage, but it will change the way their lives are led. Now, the one thing I might add that I just thought of: we're moving into the digital age, and the older people, like myself, are hanging on to text and hanging on to the old ways, but that's okay, we'll all die and, it'll, and the new age will come. But you know, that good written stuff, that textual stuff, like you said, the oral tradition, it didn't die, it got written down and we still enjoy Homer, okay? In this age, you go to the internet, you Google Blake, you want some of his poems, they're there, they're written, you can print them off and, and hold them if you want to. So I don't think... Maybe at some point, 2,000 years from now, uh, print will be dead. But at this point, it isn't. And I think it'll be a long time till people really quit finding pleasure in fondling books. You know what I mean? Because there's something about books. So we may, we may coexist peacefully, and the really important books may be books. And it, who knows what kind of books they might be. But nonetheless, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. But we're, we are heading into an age where epics are going to be a problem. And, and are people going to want to know about what Homer said? That's the other thing. What good is it? I need information here. This is an informational base, not one that's particularly literature-based base. I don't know. I can't answer that. Um, I just wanted to over here. There you are. Hi. Um, I think I'm glad you started with Aristotle. It's, sort of, it's interesting to me, I think, um, from the time of Aristotle has been, in a sense, the role of the academy to lament the dying of civilization. <laughs> and, and that's a big part of what we do. Um, and yet, it, you know, we face continual change since then. And of course, I think what's interesting now is the pace of change has accelerated so much. But I think it's also part of our job, and I, I'm very curious about this, and I've appreciated your sense of uh, how important it is to be optimistic, because that is, in some degrees, a choice that you have. Uh, I think part of the question I have is how do we start to pay attention to uh, the positives, what this does for us? What are the possibilities inherent in communicating in a new way? And maybe in some ways it's better to think in a, as a, in a mosaic. I don't know. Well. First of all, we need some experts who can help us do it. I have a, a son-in-law who does this. He does computer education. He designs programs to educate. You ask him that question, he would give you lots of answers. In other words, you, you have positives. We want to keep them. We want to enforce. Uh, we want to in, uh, reinforce them. You find what they are, and you you build systems that that support those things. And then you also, as teachers, we have to aim our students in that direction. Don't just say, go to the internet and look at this thing. We might have to go one step farther and ask them to do certain things while there. I sent my students to a, to a website about Neanderthals the other day, and I really didn't do anything but that. I said, here, read this. And, and I might have done more. I might have had them look at it a little different, more critically. And they read that. That's what's funny. They went there. They wouldn't read the book. But um, I think we, we know what's good. We know, we know it when we see it. We support it, and then we get our experts, our, our techies, our, our computer whizzes to, to design things that support that, and that's where we teach. We go that direction. 
Um, I had the uh, I had the privilege to be in India and uh, hear and uh, be part of an oral tradition, uh, someone reciting basically their version of Genesis, um, generational information, all from memory. Mm. Everyone was illiterate. And um, I thought, what a wonderful external community um, approach towards communication and language. And then we have books which are interior and very personal. And I think what's happening now is that we are getting to a situation where it will be interactive. It won't just be written. We'll have visuals. Hopefully we'll have oral. I think people are realizing we need to connect to community. There's a need to get out of one's home, to get away from just writing on the computer. Um, and so I think this whole thing is about balance and choosing all three. I know when I write, I'm a writer, and my writing process for my, non, for my books it is directly related to writing on the computer. But when I write poetry, it's got to be by hand. Mm -hmm. And when I uh, want to... Um, really connect. I enjoy uh, listening to the storytelling that's getting a renaissance. Um, but I, I will just say that I think that the oral tradition, um, it, when I was in this uh, desert in India, there, there was much more time. It was long and epic like we were talking about. The oral part is getting shorter, short little declarative sentences. The writing is shortening down. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's what's happening. I like the idea of, of just keeping the good stuff of all three traditions. And you know, instead of just, I don't know about writing, I wasn't there, but it just kind of happened. Um, we like to think we're smarter than everybody was before us. Why don't we just be proactive and make sure, most the educators in this room, why don't we just be careful to make sure that happens? Make sure that we retain all three good parts while we're teaching students who mostly use computers. Not impossible, but we have, we'd have to have a plan, wouldn't we? We'd have to have, we'd have, to have that as our plan. And that's not a, a, an army thing, that's a single person thing. Each teacher has to do that. Just from this conversation, I've gotten some ideas on, about that for my own students. I, no longer will I say, go to this website and read that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with them on it and see how they, how they read it. I have a question. Um, getting back to um, dyslexia, as mentioned in the book, where um, initially Wolf talked about the different alphabets that are used, more symbolic alphabets. Um, through the imaging they have, they can tell that they use both hemispheres of the brain more. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned that when you read Hebrew for the first time, that it was something that seemed more natural to you, and I was wondering if there was any, or if, um, say, people that, that are in a society that use a more symbolic language, like Chinese, if there's any information about um, dyslexics and, and whether they integrate into the mainstream uh, education system better. And also, I was wondering if uh, you know anything about the capability with the imaging uh, to be used for early diagnosis of children with dyslexia so that perhaps they could be set on a different educational path and avoid what all dyslexics seem to say is the worst part of it, which is the humiliation and mm -hmm. during that not knowing phase. Well, I'll answer the first part, the second part first. Um, she, she talks about early intervention in many places. This is, her, this is her passion. We've got to pick up on these kids early before they have a problem. But the testing apparently isn't particularly um, uh, high tech, not imaging per se. It has to do with naming things. How quickly do you present an image to a child and they can, they, can, they can pull its name out of the hat? People who are going to become dyslexic, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, know the names of things. It just takes them a while to dredge it up. And there, there are tests that they have devised. I think she's helped do some of it. They, there are tests that they've devised that can take a three-, four-, five-year-old and say, this kid looks good except He's scoring low here, and it has to do with naming and the milliseconds involved with dredging up the names. For some reason, that's an indicator. In fact, apparently, that's a big part of what dyslexia is. It's not the information. It's the retrieval system. 
and there's a timing um, uh, dysfunction. And so the timing goes wrong, and then once that goes wrong, everything's off the rail. But the, the, the testing is really easy. The, they just devise a test for children to name things, and they time them, and they say, let's go work with this one. These two seem okay. Now, repeat the first question because... Uh, I just wondering if, the, uh, if children that are, are being educated in other alphabets, oh. If they're dyslexic. I think from reading her book and a little bit of other stuff, there are dyslexics everywhere in all languages. But she says something interesting in here. Depending on the language spoken, the dyslexia is of a different type. There's all kinds of dyslexia. Germans are, are, have a dyslexia of this type. And um, um, maybe English-speaking people of this type, Chinese-speaking people of a different sort. That's where she discussed this idea of the language actually, pardon me, the, but the, the symbols, the figures themselves, actually then kind of form the way the brain reads. It's, it's, an in, it's a dialogue between the actual symbols and the brain centers themselves. So each, there's dyslexia, but each, uh, each culture with its own language has its own brand of dyslexia. And that's very fascinating. But apparently, just like Swedenborg said, every group has a language that matches its own genius, he called it but he didn't know what that was all about. Uh, apparently, the language forms my genius to some degree. Then my question was, that's like function follows form. I don't like that. So maybe my genius formed the language which forms my genius. I don't know. I'm just guessing. But um, every language has its dyslexics, but apparently they're of a different sort. Weird, isn't it? I mean, I guess it makes sense. Languages are that much different. Is there just not like one word is equivalent to another and it's like a decoder ring? If you've ever taken foreign languages, you know. It's really weird. I don't know how anybody ever does it. I never could very well. English is my first, second, and third language, as far as it amounts to. I um, tried. I, uh, okay, I want to come back to the sort of optimism theme about <laughs> the changes that we're seeing because. I've been teaching uh, college students, for, I've been teaching writing college students for about 15 years. and. I, Honestly, I have seen no precipitous decline in their abilities. I, maybe I'm just getting feeble-minded and I don't notice <laughs> that they're getting notice. worse. Or maybe my students here are just so much smarter than all the other students I've taught. But now, I, a decline I'm not, in, in, You haven't seen a decline in their what? Just their basic writing skills and also their capacity to learn good writing. Okay. It's been pretty consistent, I would say, over that period of time. And um, one thing I wanted to say in defense of the generation that does sort of the texting and the tweeting and all this stuff is that um, I don't really do this, but I have some sense of the fact that it's actually very inventive. It's, it's actually requires some wit to yeah. take you know, an eight letter word and boil it down to three letters or a number in two letters or something. And so I, I don't know that it's necessarily impoverishing our students' relation to language. I think it's just giving them a supplementary literacy. So, so no, of course, nobody's going to tweet an epic, but so who cares? Nobody needs to, no. I mean, although I'm sure somebody will actually try to do that as a mm -hmm. kind of experiment in language, and that's fine. So I don't see that there's, a, we have literacies that are replacing the older, perhaps more enriched literacies. I think we're just getting other ones. That no. seems fine to me. Might be, and, might and be I just want to say, because yeah, it's a dialect. Yeah, and one of the things, and mine may just be repeating something that you've been saying on a couple of occasions, what, what I see in the sort of, if we're in the third grade age of, of language, um, uh, is actually a much more aesthetically rich sort of palette in front of us in terms of how we engage with language and also how we enjoy language. And it's something that Wolf talks about a little bit, that our first ability to learn language is about sitting in a parent's lap and that mm -hmm. there's a very, very strong affective tie to the capacity well, yeah, I was doing that two nights language. ago. It's wonderful stuff. Yeah, and so I don't, I, I think this is, I enjoy teaching much more now because I have access to things like PowerPoint and I can integrate visual culture through websites and these kinds of things than say when I first started teaching large lecture courses maybe seven years ago. So I don't know, I don't, I don't think that this is, that there are reasons to despair. I don't think student skills are declining and I think there is wonderful opportunity in terms of uh, increasing the aesthetic uh, uh, dimensions of how we're engaging with language. And as you were saying earlier, uh, uh, this can only be good for the neurology of what's happening to us, right? If, if engaging with more complicated typefaces and colors and images, that this yeah. should, in theory, be making the open architecture of our brains I would think more so. nimble, right? Rather yeah. than less. 
No, I, I agree entirely. And this idea of that little language of texting, it's a dialect, it's just another language. So they still know English. I mean, they still speak it, and so, but they now speak this, and I, does that not make you richer as far as uh, the intellect goes? Yes. If they only spoke that, we'd have trouble understanding them, but they don't, just like anybody else, with more than one language. Yes. Oh, uh, really? <clears throat> One thing I've noticed uh, is how quickly some of the new media, not only, say, texting or something like that, but the use of computers or things like this, uh, how quickly it has become so very sophisticated. Thinking especially of computer games, what used to be called computer games. When our kids were little, it was Donkey Kong and very simple, yeah. crude kinds of things. Basically. Now, kids who spend a lot of time on video games or computer games, uh, not only in this country, but say in Japan or some other places, are into such things almost as virtual reality boxes, where they can not only perceive, but they interact. They read a situation, something ongoing, and then react to it, participate in it, in a very sophisticated way. And that, even more than our own fairly crude PowerPoint, I mean, I love PowerPoint, but it, to me, that's a very kind of crude, uh, simple beginning step towards something that in video games and so forth is already, oh, yeah. say, in, has gone to Q while I'm still at C or D. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> uh, and with anything that's moving rapidly, and in this case, anything that is uh, quite lucrative, and we're talking about this 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 uh, uh, this media world of ours is is uh, very lucrative in many ways. When it's moving rapidly and it's lucrative, we're going to see it going a lot of ways. We can see it going good ways. We can so it, we'll see it going in bad ways. To try to prevent it going in bad ways, forget that. That's human nature. But there are many many good ways that technology can and does go. And as I said. It's there. It's our responsibility as educators, I think, to go with it and form it and help it go the right direction. We can't stand by passively and just hope the students get something out of it. And uh, we have our experts that we can have applied to this thing. And, and I don't know why we couldn't get engaged in using it intelligently for the good, quote, and, and there will always be misuse. And the, um, the, the computer game thing is a little disturbing because of that virtual world that they descend into, that was a pejorative term, they descend into that world. Maybe they rise into it. The fact is they're in there sometimes for hours, days on end. That's something that needs to be looked at pretty carefully. We could use those technologies for training unbelievably well. Heck, they probably do, I wouldn't know. But the fact is, good or evil, it's our choice and we're going to see it both. And I think as teachers we need to guide students the right direction. Yes. Uh, first of all, like I said, I did not um, have an opportunity to read the book, but first I'd like to make a comment about the, you know, the title of the story, The Science of Reading, is that the University of Georgia has a center called Educational Therapy, and it's really what it is. It's therapy for people who have uh, problems reading mm -hmm. because of the humilities of the, you know, the elementary and the secondary school system, and ironically, the techniques that this center uses to help college students who are, reme you know, have remedial needs use new age technology such as the computer and uh, and a mixture of reading, the classics. A student actually sits and reads Bitch Potter out loud because their own voice is the most re, uh, reaffirming of what is the correct mm -hmm. language. And, and, and sort of moving from that in what is, I think, sort of uh, an interesting part that no one's talking about. They're talking about information and, and reading and the sort of the science of reading, but it's like the, it's really the politics of information because if you look at how that all the things that everybody's talking about, video games, blogging, tweeting, um, texting, 
it's it's the the control of information is in more people's hands yep. now than it has been in the past and how it's changed in democracy. And a great example of that is, is that look at the power of how many people use texting to get out the message and, and raise money for this last presidential election. That's the, po that's the politics and the power of information uh, that is a, a gap that is much gaining much quicker than just the recent resources of the educational therapy. It's like we're just now getting to develop therapy programs for the lack of learning. Mm -hmm. But yet, we're using new age technology as a way to, uh, to deal with that lack of learning. And I uh, was wondering what you was thinking about, what you think about the fact that universities are now using Blackboard uh, the virtual classrooms, uh, you know, such as settings like this, but yet we still are disconnected from uh, our secondary schools that are setting students up t to universities that need educational right. therapy. Well, I have no answer there except uh, we need to talk to them. Uh, according to Marianne Wolf, Educational therapy is intervention in a way that teaches children to read however they need to learn to read. In other words, individualized. And for many years, teaching, learn, uh, teaching reading was not individualized at all. Many of us were taught out of the same books, by the same method, by the same nice teachers, and there was, just a, a, there was a routine we went through, and you either got it or you didn't, and most of the kids got it, Therefore, it wasn't a problem. And he had two or three that didn't. But now, as I understand her to speak, that's, that's, going, that's out the window. Children are identified early when they don't read properly. And they are then taught. It's not like they can't learn to read. They just can't learn to read this way. And so they immediately, rather than remediate them, they just teach them another way. So you can't read it this way, try it that way. If you don't like the letters going this way, try them that way. So they individualize it, and in doing so, they pick up, call them dyslexics if you like, or anything else, and they teach people to read. Whatever it takes, that's what it is. Now, it's, that's not cost effective, but it works, and schools are doing it. According to her, she's in the, I think she's kind of in the forefront of that. Individual, individualized reading instruction for children instead of one size fits all. And I, got, I got taught on the Dick and Jean series, you know. It was okay. I liked it. Spot, he was okay. But uh, if you didn't learn that very well, you quickly fell behind. And we had stratification in my school, first, second, and third reading groups. Dun, dun, dun. You wouldn't want to be in the third and go home and tell your mom that. But that, un that doesn't happen anymore. So well, it's good. We're making progress. As far as universities speaking to secondary schools, I don't know how we get that to happen. That's interdisciplinary, you know, like I said earlier. A lot of talk about that, but it doesn't happen very much because of turf and all that business. But it needs to happen. I'll ask a question. Okay. What do you think Socrates would say about YouTube and the oral tradition? His head would probably explode. <laughs> but if it didn't explode, I have no idea. He would say, probably, the same thing he said about written words. Now, it's 6,000 years later. We're into a new phase. He would probably say, well, Kind of like I'm saying, it's here, let's make the best of it. He was a wise man, he probably would say that. I have one more question. Yes. Um, you said a little bit a while ago that we as educators have to guide students how to use the new technologies. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned that you love to use PowerPoint. PowerPoint became popular 20 years ago. Huh? And students today know much more about technologies. Don't you think that maybe we have to accept the fact that they might have to be our teachers and we have to follow them, rather than living up to the idea that we are the teachers and we have to guide them? Well, yeah, that's feedback. Sure, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. They'll tell you what. If, if, you're, if you're okay with it, they'll tell you what works and what doesn't. 
and then that's feedback, and then you adapt your plan accordingly. If it makes sense, yeah. Thing? Well, I'm going to say one more thing. Okay. Go ahead and say it. Looks like we have exhausted the conversation. We exhausted have a lot me, I'll tell you that much. Uh, we have a lot more to say. So technology makes a lot of things possible. One of the things that happened while the conversation was taking place, and unbeknownst to me because my cell phone was turned off, Professor Marianne Wolf called and left a message on my iPhone because I had tried to give her a couple, I tried to get a couple of numbers to call at. One of the numbers I gave her is here. But I guess technology allowed me to reach her in Boston, but she called the number, my cell phone number, so, but she left, left a message. But before she left the message on my cell phone, she was kind and gracious enough to send an email earlier in the day, which now we can show you and what she thinks about this whole event. Yes. Her message was, who is this fool yeah. talking about my book without my knowledge? I know what the message was. I'm glad it didn't come true. There you go. Very nice. And, and so there's the comment from the source, which once again create, you know, puts us in this kind of dilemma about the possibilities and mispossibilities, if you will, of sure, communication right. and technology. We did good. But we also have some good Greek wine in a, in a lounge nearby. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not Greek. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's one of the oldest traditions we have kept. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. I, I want to make a couple of announcements before, you, before we uh, move on to the next uh, reception area. I want to tell you about the... Oh, I have a piece of paper. Do you mind if I... Our next speaker uh, has just left. His name is Tim Ford. He's a dean of graduate studies and a world expert on the issue of water. That's the next seminar. You should all have... Uh, these kinds of schedules, if you don't, they're available on the website. We have brochures here, and please avail yourselves of them and go to our website. It has all kinds of information. I also want to announce an event coming up very soon, and that's on October 8th uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, Professor Rob Haskell, who's sitting here, is Professor Emeritus of Psychology, uh, very uh, well-established authority in uh, uh, unconscious communication, or subliteral communication, among other things, who will be giving an interesting lecture on the importance of the humanities uh, in, a, in an age of cognitive science. This is October 8th at 6 p.m. in the same place. And, um, and one more thing, among mm -hmm. the center, among the other things it does, it organizes seminars again around the globe. And just I had them someplace here. I had some brochures. Okay. I have, I have, on May 2010, I have a bunch of them, we are going to be sponsoring a, a seminar in Granada, Spain. Uh, it's going to be on Islam, uh, on Europe and the Islamic Mediterranean. We have invited one of the world's leading scholars on the subject. Professor Nabil Matar, who is a presidential professor at the University of Minnesota, who kindly accepted to do it, is a very timely issue. And uh, so it will, it, this seminar will take place in Granada, Spain, in the last two weeks of May. Um, the information is here for those who want it. Uh, we are trying to make the prices very reasonable. Uh, the, uh, the scholar himself was kind enough to make him himself available at a very reasonable price as well. So if you are interested, please get some of these brochures or at any given time, visit us at our website. Okay, and the students who are taking this for credit, if you would meet me right down here, yeah. I'd appreciate it. And thank you all for your attention. This has been great.
would follow me to the uh, Connors Lounge because I know it's not easy to find. We have desserts and some 